So in my last talk, I discussed the pre- and post-selected system of a spin hat. So <coughs> we say that if at time t1, I know that the spin in the x direction is equal to 1. And if at time t2, I know that the spin in the y direction is equal to 1. Then in the time in between, the system is described by two vectors, one going forward in time and one going back in time. And we know both sigma x equal to 1 and sigma y equal to 1. And then I showed that if we do weak measurement on the time in between, indeed we can find that the sum of sigma x plus sigma y is equal to 2, because the weak measurement didn't disturb either of them. And I had to do the experiment many, many times before I learned the information. But once I do it many times, and I pick up only the result when I was successful in the final choice, then indeed we see a new kind of reality that I call weak reality. I want now to discuss the two vector situation, not for spin half, but actually for a particle, and see what interesting things we can say about that. So, so I have one dimension now. This is T, and this is the position X. And I assume that my initial state at time T1 is a path is described by a Gaussian. The wave function is a Gaussian centered around this region of space. And I look at the time evolution of this uh, wave function, and I know that it's spreading in time because the Gaussian is spreading in time. And at a later time, T2, I make a measurement and find again the particle in this region. So what will be the future vector? The future vector will be something that will go back in time like that. So there is something very interesting that is going on here. First of all, let's see what I can say about weak values here. I have the initial state is psi 1 of x and t. And the final state is psi 2 star of x and t if I go back in time. So I claim now that I can write a new kind of density, rho of x and t, which is the product of these two functions divided by the integral. This is the weak value This is the weak value of the projection operator. If I look at the projection operator on position x, and I want to calculate its weak value, then I will see that the weak value of that will be the product of psi 2 star of x and t times psi 1 of x and t divided by the, the product. That's the weak value of the projection operator on position x. And that means that I can define now a new kind of density function. And there will be also a current j of x and t in one dimension. It will be the derivative of this function with respect to time times this minus the complex conservative times i, exactly the same way that I define current when I have the two wave functions equal to each other. Now I have the pre-selected and the post-selected function. It gives me a row, new kind of row, which can be positive, negative, even complex, but there is a meaning to that. And I have a conservation law that the row dt is equal to the advance of j is equal to 0. So I have now a new picture here that say, from the time, from the present day, Original time, I had this wave function. From the future time, I had this wave function. 
So if I do weak measurement, I will find the particle only in this region of space, because it's the product of the two functions. But there's something very interesting that's going on here that is really amazing. When I do the post-selection, this is again time, I do here the post-selection and find the particle in the Gaussian here. I send this particle, this wave function back in time, so that means that to find this state at the end, I had to start here in the middle with a Gaussian that is spread, that is going back in time and concentrated here. This is something that is impossible to prepare, usually in the laboratory. But by this post-selection, I am able to prepare something that looks very, very complicated. And nevertheless, I can see that it's there, because if I do the measurement of the density in the time in between, I know the psi that comes from this direction, so I know that also the psi that comes back to the future, I can calculate what it is, and I see that indeed, by this measurement, I was able to prepare initially in time something that goes against the, the usual time direction, because this thing that goes back and concentrated here is something that I would never be able to prepare in the laboratory. But in this way, I'm able to do it. So it looks like the fact that I have a vector that goes back in time allows me to consider in the laboratory now really situations where I see a combination from normal time direction and also for something that is prepared in the opposite direction, which is very difficult to do usually in the laboratory. So you can even ask the following question. <coughs> Suppose I have two channels. I have, the particle can go inside this channel or it can go inside this channel. So I can start a linear superposition of the particle being in this and this superposition. And then the post-selection, I post-select it to be here. So now, what can I say about the time in between? One way to say it is I have two information. From the past, the particle is necessarily in the superposition. From the future, I know that the particle is only here, right? So this is a very, very uh, bad language, because how can I say that I'm certain at a given time that the particle is in two locations, and at the same time, I'm certain that the particle is only one location? These two statements are completely contradictory. So we must find a new language to talk about it, and I will describe this new language in my talk tomorrow. I want now to say something else about uh, this situation. Suppose... Yeah? Can, can, can I ask a question? Yes. Can, can I approach the whiteboard? Please. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> I, I, I'm looking at this this picture. Yeah. This is time. Yes. So, in your description, this is time equals zero. This is negative time. Yeah, but, 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 but 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 time goes forward. In, in yeah. Time. Right. So I can I can interpret this. Yeah. In two ways, and I'm not sure uh, which way you you prefer. No. One is to say that uh, I have some uh, hypothetical lab. I'm almighty experimentalist, and I choose a, a particular a amplitude distribution here of my wave packets with phases and amplitude and so on, such that as they propagate, mm -hmm. they end up at this, this, <coughs> this, this, this <coughs> interpretation number one. Yeah. But interpretation number two, 
mm. would be to say, aha, I end up here. Yeah. Now, and I start, I'm telling you, yeah. I started here. Yeah. Now, there are a, a, a cause. By the way, you know, you did not finish here. Because here you could also say, I prepared that state, and I also prepared another state, and, there, and both of them are there. Okay, I mean, fine, but I, I'm, I'm talking about uh, 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 one, one particle at the moment. Yeah. Okay, so, so the, the other thing is to uh, rely on, uh, on, on Feynman yeah. and uh, uh, do the following. I mean, I started here. I'm telling you that I started at a given point. Yeah. And now I have a huge number of trajectories. Uh, this is one trajectory, this is another, this is another. And among all these zillion trajectories, I will have one that comes here, another one that comes here, a, a, a small subset that arrives here. Yeah. And, and the fact that I, I, I end up here means yeah. that I did some post-selection of only this yeah. subset that arrives here. So these, these two pictures seems to me very different. So no, one, they're... So, so which one would you uh, consider to be your favorite? The point is, the, the final picture is just a way to calculate things. It's not, here I'm talking about things that I can actually measure directly physically. I'm saying that if I have the post-selection that I found the particle here, and the pre-selection that the particle was here, I say now that I have a new picture that says that both of them were valid, and if I look at the time evolution of this one, it gives me a density that is spread over here. If I look at the time going backwards, it tells me that this is completely equivalent to having prepared initially a state that is spread everywhere here, and that spread goes in the same time towards here. And I see here in the region in between both combinations, and because I can measure the density at each point, that density is a product of the thing that propagated from the past, and the thing that propagated back from the future, which is the same as being in the past, preparing that state, and setting it forward in time. And I can actually see that both of them are there, because when I do weak measurement, I have the product of the two. I know the usual picture of what happens when you evolve in time like this. This gives me psi. I know what is the product of psi 2 times psi 1 when I do the weak measurement. So in fact, from the measurement here, I can see that indeed what was prepared here is a very, very complicated state here. The properties is in time. And that gave me the product of psi 2 star times psi 1. So it's very interesting to take this picture seriously. I believe that also all the panels came independently to this idea that you make a collapse, you have to go so backwards in time. So the idea here is I have two collapses. That collapse went to affected the future, also the past here. But that collapse also affected the past of this time. And I see here a new picture of a density that is made out of product of something that propagated normally in time and something that was prepared in a very complicated way, if I wanted to do it, that evolved like this. And I see that both of them are there by looking at the product of psi 2 star psi 1. Is this clear? Is this I think this is very important, so I, I, I want to, to hear more questions about it. Yes. I can also describe another example. Suppose that we describe the same idea. Suppose I have a hydrogen atom that I prepared initially at time t1 in an excited state and I propagate it in time. So I know that eventually 
a photon will be emitted if I wait enough time. But much, much later, I make another measurement and find still that the hydrogen atom is still excited. How am I going to describe it? I'm going to say that from the past, I know that there was a photon wave that was spreading out of the atom. Because I found it here, I know that there is another wave function, a photon coming in and exciting the hydrogen atom here. So it's a, me a measurement of the weak measurement of the electromagnetic outside densities, I will find that it's built out of a product of outgoing photon and ingoing photon. And I can see it in the laboratory. So indeed, this picture suggests that there is a very simple way of preparing something that usually in the laboratory I can't do. I can't prepare in the laboratory a wave function of a photon in the past that knows exactly to come to the hydrogen atom and excite it later. But in this two quantum mechanics tells us that I do two measurements. I prepare this thing that up to now we thought is impossible to prepare. This is a very important point. Any questions about that? So yeah, you're just to, you're yes. Here, the evidence that you succeeded in preparing this is the outcome of the weak, uh, of, of the weak measurements of this system. Yeah, the weak and measurements showed me that right. indeed I was so able to prepare it. It's a little bit indirect. Sorry? It's, it's a little bit indirect. You don't see just that state. You see the contribution of No, I see a product of two states. Yes, yes. And that, and because I know the product from the weak measurement, yes. I know one of them, so I can calculate the other. Yes. And when I calculate the other, I say, lo and behold, really there was also a photon coming from here, or there was an electron that was prepared in this very complicated state, and by making a measurement here of the densities of the ensemble, when I succeeded for all those cases, that I collect all the results of experiment for those cases, I find that indeed here, the density that I measured was a product of two densities. One populated from the past, which is the normal one, and one populated like this, which is an abnormal one, but I was able to prepare it. That's very interesting. Yes. Okay. Yes. In the hydrogen example, again, P2, you wanted to be excited. P1, what was the requirement? Yeah, I start with excited atom. You start and you end with excited atom. I start with wait much longer than the lifetime. Mm -hmm. And nevertheless, there is still a very small probability to find it excited. Yes. I look at these two boundaries for this. Ask now, what can I say about the densities of the electromagnetic waves in the time in between? One I, possibility is that it did not decay. Hmm? Just one possibility is that there will be nothing. Yeah, but, yeah, but that's not the case. It does? That doesn't happen. Okay. If you do weak measurement, you know that it is the product of two states. One state that you started with the hydrogen excited here, you propagate it towards the future, you know that there will be a, a, a wave, electromagnetic wave that is spreading out, describing a photon going in all directions. That's one vector. Then you come here and find that the atom was excited. You ask, how could the atom be excited here? The only way that you can describe it, but say, let me go back in time and see that when I go back in time, that atom emits a photon. So in my time, I see a photon that comes in. And I'm saying, quantum mechanics tells you that if you do weak measurement, on the densities here, it will be a product of the density that comes from the past and density comes from the future. So I will not see empty things here. In fact, I think we published an article together with... Uh, the yeah, it was something similar. We call it no barking dog, right? Uh, we described exactly the similar situation. <laughs> that, for example, you have... Suppose I have a cavity and there is a 
part of his Austria back and forth, it has a small probability to go out every time. So again, you see it seems amplitude going out. Much later, you still find the part of it in, so you see amplitude that comes in. And in fact, with measurement, we show you that most of them did exist. Yes? Yes. Yes. In the first case, when you have the atom, you could have, you could say that you know that the state, the rest of the state, is all in the vacuum state plus this one yeah. particle. Yeah. Right. And that one particle is sitting there, and its mode that it emits. Is, the atom. Yeah. Is, yeah. Is something that goes out. Yeah. Modes are positive frequency things, and so as a result, there's going to be some spread out. But anyway, forget about that. In yeah. the future, however, in order to do something similar, you would also have to say that there are no other photons anywhere else in that place. Yeah. That otherwise, you have an incomplete future. Of course, of course. I'm saying that I'm given the following hypothetical problem. I have just one single atom in the whole space. And no, 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 that, that, that's an initial condition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the final yeah. condition, you have to go ahead and, and make a, you have to make, say, state that you've made a measurement everywhere else in space. So, no, look, I am saying there. that if, if I have a closed cavity, and, and in the closed cavity, I know from the beginning that there is only one single atom no, which is excited. Huh? Even in a closed cavity, there could be 27 atoms. I know, no, but I'm saying, given the information, these, these are thought experiments. I have a thought experiment which I know that the total energy inside the cavity is given just by this one excited atom. No, because you're going to go in there and you're going to do measurements in the in between, which is good to have. No, no, these weak measurements don't change anything. But, but no, don't do, be, before you do any measurement, let us see what quantum mechanics tells us about this problem. I have a single atom inside the closed cavity, and I know that the only thing inside the closed cavity is just the single atom, the rest is just vacuum. That's a statement about energy, more or less. I have the energy up to this small uncertainty. I know that the whole energy inside the cavity is this energy. And now I ask, what does quantum mechanics tell me from this initial state, what propagates? So I know that our quantum mechanics tell me that sometime later there will be a, super, a superposition of a state where the atom is still excited and vacuum outside, plus the atom in the ground state, and there is expanding electromagnetic wave corresponding to a single photon. And that I know how to calculate this as a function of time. Then I say, that I wait much longer than the lifetime, there is still an exponentially small probability to find no photon and excited atom. These are predictions. So I say, what would happen if I have these two boundary conditions? What can I say about the time in between? One possibility is to say, if you find the atom at the end excited, you know there was never any photon out, and you will see in the time in between, just vacuum. And the state. other possibility, you believe the two vector pieces. And you say, I have now vectors that come from the past, which includes expanding electromagnetic phase, uh, electromagnetic wave, vector coming from the future, the described incoming electromagnetic wave, and then the weak density of the electromagnetic field outside will be a product of these two things. And I'm saying experimentally, you can show that that is the correct picture. So it will be, you will have two photons? Sorry? You, so you will see two photons? No, not two photons. So when, when you say the product? The, uh, the product is the density. So, uh, if, but what do you mean by product? Hmm? Amplitude. The weak value of the... If I calculate, look, if I make, if I calculate the density, it's better to think, to think about uh, electron because the head of photons, the measurement of the electric field 
changes the number of photons. So let's, let's think instead of that, that I have a, a closed, in the vacuum I have a closed box, a single electron is oscillating inside, and the walls of the, the, walls of the box allow some leakage out. So if I calculate the, what happens in time, I start the electrons inside the box, I wait for later time, I see there is a superposition of the electrons still inside the box and outgoing wave outside. This is the picture coming from the past. Much, much later, where the probability of the electrons still being inside the box is extremely small, I consider the possibility of making another measurement and finding that real situation. I ask now, what can I say about the time in between? When I'm saying that the prediction of the two vector is that the time in between you will see outgoing state of a single bottom going out, a single electron going outside, and another incoming thing, and the density to find the electron at any point will be the product of these two. Now, this density can be positive and negative, and then you can come to the picture that I said that with you know, negative electron, but that's a complication. First, so the idea is that the two vectors suggest something new. From the one vector picture, you would say, look at that, I find the electron much later there, it means that it never left the box, and there should be um, something empty outside. The two vector picture, no. There is really the thing that comes from the past, that tells you there is the electron going out, leaking out. The thing that comes back from the future tells you the electron coming in. And what you do by, when you measure the density outside, it will be a product of these two things. And that is really what happens in the in, in laboratory. The key, the key yeah? I'm a bit confused. Usually, the unusual which values come about when the initial state and the final state are almost orthogonal. Yeah. No, they are almost yeah. orthogonal. They're almost orthogonal. Well, uh, you you start have to the initial state to the final state. Small. You start with the initial state. Evolution. Yeah, evolution. Huh? Yeah. 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 You 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 withdraw your question. But but uh, may I just be the devil's advocate of who is talking? Uh, lately. Oh yeah. No, no. Oh yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. I'm devil's advocate of the standard approach. In a standard approach, if I prepared my atom here, which the bo uh, my box and my electrons sp spread out, so before this final measurement, they say it's a little here, it's all over, hmm. and then I collapse and find it here. Yeah. I don't say be before that it wasn't outside; it was everywhere, and then. Now it's collapsed here. This is the standard picture. Yeah, and I suggest a different picture. What? Yes. Okay, this is very important. In the old picture of the collapse, if this is time, and I started initially the particle described by some Gaussian here, then the idea was that this thing starts to spread, and I come to this time, I make a measurement, I find it here. Then in the old picture was that up to this instant, the particle was completely spread, and only from then on, it will start to be, to be here. In fact, this picture is very unsatisfactory because it's not covariant. If I go to another frame of reference, moving frame of reference, I will find that in one frame of reference, the, here, the zero probability, but I can go to another frame of reference where this is the equal time, and the probability here will not be zero. In fact, there is an article that I wrote with Dave Albert. He wrote it, of course, but we were together. And then we said that we need, in order to describe the collapse covariantly, we need to describe many, many different pictures. Now, 
with the new picture that I suggest, it's very nice because it's also covariant. I'm saying now that if I find the particle initially here, I find the particle finally here, then I go back in time, and I say that's the only reason where there was different probability different from zero. This is a covariant picture. And that's a much nicer picture of the collapse. If you I say the collapse is relevant also for the past and not only for the future, you can see that this picture will be a covariant way to describe the collapse. Yeah, I fully agree. Just I wanted to defend your accused standard interpretation that, it's, that the, the electron remains all the time in the box. And this is, I just wanted to say what standard will say. Any other questions? OK, tomorrow I will have something much nicer to say about it, but I think it's enough for today because it's more than 12 o'clock. Thank you very much.